Good evening, everybody. My name is Laurel McDonald, and I'm the director of the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. It's my great honor and great pleasure on behalf of the University of Toronto Libraries to welcome you to the 22nd annual Alexander C. Pathy Lecture on Book Arts. To begin, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful for the opportunity to work on it. And since this uh, lecture is being delivered online, um, I invite you to consider your own position with regard to the land where you find yourself today. So welcome everybody to the Alex Pathy Lecture on the Book Arts. Um, to begin, I very much wish to thank um, Alec Pathy, Professor Emeritus. Um, in addition to his academic career, Professor Pathy served as at the University of Toronto as Vice President of Business Affairs and as Vice President of Human Resources as well. Professor Pathy throughout the years has been a tremendous advocate, not only for the Fisher Rare Book Library, but for the University of Toronto Library system as a whole. Um, he served as an advisor to our advancement office on the Boundless Campaign, and his, his guidance um, and his wisdom um, has been appre appreciated by all of us tremendously. So at the Fisher, though, we're particularly grateful to Dr. Pathy for his ongoing sponsorship of this wonderful lecture series and for helping us to bring in um, wonderful guest lectures, such as the one that we have this evening. Um, I know that Dr. Pathy um, is with us today in the audience, um, as well as his daughters, Carolyn and Barbara. And, and again, a special thanks to Dr. Pa Pathy um, for his um, wonderful sponsorship of this, this lecture series. So thank you, Dr. Pathy. So I'm very pleased to introduce um, this evening's guest speaker, Alexander, Alexandra Gillespie. Um, Professor Gillespie is a very bus busy person um, she is the principal at the University of Toronto Mississauga, vice uh, president um, at the University of Toronto, as well as professor of English and medieval studies. Um, her research is concerned with medieval and early modern texts and books, especially the shift from manuscript to print, the relationship um, between book history, literary criticism and literary theory, the global development of early book technologies, and digital and non-destructive scientific approaches to the study of postmodern books, or pre-modern books rather. Professor um, Gillespie is a faculty member at the University of Toronto Mississauga, Department of English and Drama, and the University of Toronto Department of English, Center for Medieval Studies and Collaborative Program in Book History and Print Culture. She's a fellow at Victoria College and at Trinity College at the University of Toronto as well. This evening, Dr. Gillespie will discuss books from the Silk Road in the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. And now with all of the Friends of the Fisher Lecture, um, as per usual, there's a question and answer period, a live question and answer period at the end of the talk. So we encourage you to put your questions into the Zoom chat. Um, and you don't have to wait to the end of the lecture. You can put your questions in um, as we go along. So um, I will now turn um, the lecture podium over to Professor Gillespie. Let me start by offering my warm thanks to the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library, especially to Laurel McDonald, uh, to John Shoesmith, and to the Friends of the Fisher for their generous invitation and support to me to give this year's Alexander C. Pathy Lecture on the Book Arts. I'm so pleased to do so, and I felt even more pleased when I learned that Professor Pathy was himself a Vice President of the University of Toronto for over a decade. As you just heard, it's my privilege to serve in that role as well, as a Vice President here at Toronto and as Principal of the University of Toronto, Mississauga. The UTM campus sits alongside the Missinihi, the river that the French and British called the Credit, because at its mouth, at Port Credit, they traded with indigenous peoples who for thousands of years had traveled and stewarded its waters and the lands around it. 
I'm a Pākehā New Zealander from an English, Scottish and French German colonial family that settled in Whakatū and Te Whanganui Ātara in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But now I'm raising my family on the UTM campus, on the traditional lands of the Wenda and the Seneca, in the principal's residence, by the waters and on the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I wanted to start my talk today by acknowledging this and the guidance of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the friendship that they've shown to me in this role, to all of UTM and to our wider University of Toronto community, to those we work with and live with locally, provincially and internationally as we seek together to live a good life. Chi miigwech. The first part of my paper today goes from England to Constantinople. Last time I gave a talk uh, for the Friends of the Fisher was over a decade ago. I was just an assistant professor and I spoke about my work on a book that I very soon after published called Lydgate and Chaucer in Print. There's the cover. This book was about the transmission of the works of two famous English literary authors from manuscript into print soon after their deaths in the 15th and early 16th century in England. My topic today, books from the Silk Roads in the Fisher Library, is quite a distance from that earlier area of inquiry. So I want to start today by reflecting on my journey from a literary historian of late medieval England with a special interest in printing to someone who thinks about books um, as they are in locations around the globe, about rolls and leaves, screen folds, tablets, and even standing stones, like the, this one, archiving petroglyphs um, of the Kino, Kino Mage Wapkong of the Curve Lake Nation here in Ontario in Canada. There is a connection between this sort of work and my earlier career, and indeed my earlier paper for Fisher's Friends, so I'm going to try to explain it. I came to the study of English manuscripts and the advent of printing in something of a fit of peak. I chose my topic after a class um, during one of my first year courses at the University of Oxford on textual criticism and bibliography. Um, during this class, we were presented with the usual story about the history of the book. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that we've all encountered versions of this story. It's a story centered on Christian Europe. It's a story of technological and societal progress from the early Roman tablet and perhaps the Hebrew scroll to the biblical codex of late antiquity to the early modern printing press of the Gutenberg Bible to today's digital age. It is the story of the so-called rise of the codex, of the Gutenberg or Google revolutions, each of these technological changes ushering in a new, more triumphant Western way of thinking. It's a story that has tremendous currency, in part thanks to the work of another professor from Toronto, Marshall McLuhan, who in the 1960s offered statements like this one for popular consumption. And um, I'm, I'm going to quote from a different part of, um, of the Playboy magazine article in which he says this, um, but here are some images from um, that particular magazine. What he says is, the advent of printing in Western Europe was directly responsible for the rise of such disparate phenomena as nationalism, the Reformation, the assembly line and its offspring, the Industrial Revolution, the whole concept of causality, Cartesian and Newtonian concepts of the universe, perspective in art, narrative chronology and literature, and a psychological mode of introspection or inner direction. So I went to this class in Oxford in the 1990s and I heard something like this story. My first objection to its account of an overwhelmingly powerful technological revolution arose because I was a passionate student already of medieval literatures and cultures. If this was the prevailing idea about what books were and why they mattered, as I felt I was being taught to believe, then I felt alarmed. The narrative's focus on the post-Gutenberg period ignored or erased thousands of years of bookish history. My professor at the time um, said that printing had all but invented the modern idea of the author. So I set to work to show that, at least in England, the poet Geoffrey Chaucer, his imitators and the scribes working by hand in the century before printing to copy his works, inherited and reinscribed ancient ideas about books and ways of making them, and indeed authors, and that without those ideas, the work of a printer like William Caxton was not properly intelligible. But even as I began this research, I was aware of a stronger objection to the myth 
that Gutenberg changed everything with his printing press, and that this objection was geographical rather than temporal. If printing was so transformational, if it was the driving force behind the very conditions of Western modernity, then why was only the Western world so transformed, or transformed in this particular way by the technology of printing? Gutenberg's Bible was not the first book printed using movable type. This was, or at least the first surviving one, a Buddhist teaching te text from Korea printed in 1377, 75 years before Gutenberg set up shop. And lying behind this Korean movable type book were hundreds of years of other East Asian block printing traditions. Here is the famous printed Diamond Sutra dated to 868, found in the library cave at Dunhuang in northwest China, the first dated printed book in history. The version of book history that I was offered in that one class at Oxford is a familiar one, but I had a hunch then, and I've come to believe more and more, that it's a version of history that denigrates and even erases those cultural traditions of history keeping and bookmaking which do not support its narrative. That includes cultural traditions about which we know quite a lot, like the work of Chaucer and the scribes who copied his works, or indeed many of the other medieval and antique Western writers and the craftspeople who helped to transmit their work. But what is erased also includes cultural traditions about which we don't know very much, where our ignorance is in fact an outcome of longer histories of Western colonial violence towards the non-Western past. Consider, for example, the screenfold books of Mesoamerica. Um, this is the Codice Maya de Mexico. It is one of only four pre-Columbian Mayan codices known to have survived the colonial era and the only one still in Mexico. Three more were carried back to Europe along with other New World loot. The rest, and there were thousands upon thousands, um, were destroyed in actions like the book burning that Diego de Landa describes in the Yucatan in 1562. He says, we found a, l a large number of books in these characters, and as they contained nothing, which were not to be seen as superstition and lies of the devil, we burned them all which they regretted to an amazing degree and which caused them much affliction. The story of how printing invented Western civilization is a story that loses so many books, books that were destroyed or stolen in the service of Western imperialism and colonization, books that have been displaced from the communities best placed to understand and appreciate them, books that are simply neglected because they don't tell the history of the book the way we're used to hearing it. And that brings me to a book that I promised to begin with in the blurb that I wrote for this talk, the first of the books um, I will describe today that is a precious holding of the Fisher Library, um, and that belongs in meaningful ways to a history of the global networks we call the Silk Roads. And this is it, Freiburg 131. It's a copy of the Arba Charim, an important legal treatise by the rabbi um, Jacob ben Asher, who was born in Cologne, but composed this work in Toledo in Spain in about 1300 in the Common Era. Its four parts treat devotional, ritualistic, marital, and civil Jewish law. It discusses prayers, blessings, the Sabbath, holy days, fasting, laws related to the ritual slaughter of animals, unclean food, idolatry and mourning, marriage and the marriage contract, and divorce. It was a kind of handbook for living in the late medieval Jewish diaspora, and dozens of manuscript copies of the text survive, most of them copied in the hands of Iberia, Iberian, Sephardic, and Western European Ashkenazi scribes, but a few in the hands of bookmakers from the Eastern Mediterranean and North African Jewish communities. This copy of the text from the Fisher is not a manuscript, but a printed book. According to its colophon, it was printed on December the 13th, 1493 in Constantinople on the press of the brothers David and Samuel Ibn Namias. This makes it the earliest um, book known to have been printed in Turkey or anywhere else in North Africa or anywhere in the then Ottoman Empire, because this is after um, the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople, or indeed the former Byzantine Empire. It's a, as an object, it's witness to its own maker's complex transnational networks. The brothers were Sephardi Jews, probably from the town of Hijar in Aragon. 
This is um, from where um, they took some of the borders that they used when they printed the book. Like so many others, they had fled Iberia in 1492 following the Alhambra decree expelling Jews who would not convert to Christianity. They fled to Constantinople, where the Sultan Bayezid II and his government would not only tolerate Jewish presence, um, just as former, former Muslim rulers in Iberia had, but would permit these brothers and other Jews to practice their trades and crafts, including printing. The Ibn Nabmias brothers stayed in Constantinople, still permitted to operate their press for a couple of decades, even as the Ottomans themselves continued to eschew print. They did not feel they needed it to administer what turned out to be a very long-lasting empire. Their rich literary culture continued to depend on texts copied by hand. The Jewish printers who worked among them thus retained close connection with printers and sellers of printed books in continental Europe. The brother's type came from the shop of a printer called Joshua Soncino in Naples. Soncino printed an edition of the Arbiterum in 1490, um, collating several manuscript sources. One of those manuscripts, otherwise lost, appears to have served uniquely as an exemplar for the brothers when they printed the text in Constantinople. There was a great traffic in goods and crafts and people between Italy and Constantinople in this period. It went hand in hand with European fear of the Mus Muslim conquerors of the Byzantine East. It's no surprise that at least one of the copies of this book that my colleague and collaborator, James Sagan, has examined, um, this, this, in this case one in the Bodleian, appears to have been bound in Italy. A few annotations surviving in the Fisher copy, and here's one in the margin here, margin here, and it's much clearer under UV light, are in what appear to be um, Ashkenazi Italian hands. The 1493 Arba Turim testifies to a trade across the Mediterranean in other ways. There were no paper mills in Turkey at this time. The Ottomans relied on stocks from Venice and Valencia. Some of the paper in this book bears watermarks that Dr. Sargon has traced to mills in Valencia. Correcting earlier accounts, Dr. Sargon has also shown that most of the paper is not from Italy, as previously thought, but from mills much further north, in Germany, possibly in Cologne, which returns us quite nicely, full circle, to the birthplace of the author of this text, Rabbi Jacob himself. Now, I really like this book, as I do many books in the Fisher. I, I, I think I like it about as much as I have over the years disliked reading in venues like The Economist, which was particularly guilty of these narratives in the 90s and 2000s. I, I dislike reading the claim that the transition to digital media is the biggest thing since Gutenberg invented the printing press. Claims that in the West, printing made information more free and the world more educated, richer, and more civilized. And it's happening again. The big data age is upon us, and now information is even more free. I do not think that this is true, and not just because no one who's been on Twitter would suggest it as a civilizing or educating force. It's not the truth about how knowledge is created and dispersed, um, and has been over history, because it ignores so much history of books, because it leaves so much truth unpursued, including historical truths about oppression and freedom, travel and trade, information and faith, there to be uncovered in a book like the Constantinople Arba Turim. Of course, many scholars, not just me, have challenged the Gutenberg myth, and by close work on books and the cultures that produce them have added thickly to our knowledge of what technologies and ri of writing and printing and um, oral telling can do and also don't do. But their new ideas have not really penetrated public consciousness, or not as much as I would like, certainly not here in Canada where I live, where McLuhan's ideas still have such currency. In part, I think that's because McLuhan's story is easy to absorb. That idea of a revolutionary leap forward achieved by one white male Western genius. How well that fits with a Eurocentric and colonial way of thinking. The first time I gave a lecture for the Friends of the Fisher, it was about some great men of English history, about Chaucer and Caxton. I had been taught as a humanities PhD student at Oxford to work as history seemed to suggest these men did, um, in the way that it singles them out by name and, and genius. My job was to work independently, to produce novel, original ideas, to claim these as mine, to focus on a narrow slice of knowledge so I could master it, to publish 
a monograph just by me on it. Now this did teach me discipline for which I am endlessly grateful and it also taught me some deep expertise and those matter, we need experts. But once I was done, once I had made the narrow point I could make by myself um, about a few people on a small cold island at the edge of a continent 600 years ago, I felt I had to do something else to untell the too easy triumphalist story of the book in Western civilization. And I knew I didn't have a hope of doing that on my own. And that brings me to the second part of my paper, which is called Old Books, New Science. I no longer work independently as a researcher. I direct a laboratory, a word familiar from the sciences, but for me just means, you know, following its etymology, a space, real, virtual, kind of multiple as well, for collaborative labors. I am the principal investigator and director of the Old Books New Science Lab at the University of Toronto. But it's not just me. Um, there are nearly 20 staff, PhD students, undergraduate RAs, and postdoctoral fellows, and this is some of us. 30 months ago, we began a project, The Book in the Silk Roads, with generous funding from the Mellon Foundation. The funds were entrusted to us so that we could work together with even more other people to prepare the ground for and to begin to build a global research network dedicated to the study of old books. And here is our website from that project. I was absolutely not to do this alone. That wasn't the plan. As PI, I applied for the grant with co-investigators, just for a start. One was Suzanne Akbari, previously of U of T. She's now a permanent professor at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. Unlike me, she had spent most of her career working on transnational and cross-cultural exchange in the pre-modern period, especially in regions of the Mediterranean and the Horn of Africa. The other co-PI was Sean Meikle, the Director of Information Technology at University of Toronto, to Toronto's Libraries, where our project librarian Rachel DeCrash and our developer Shibo Liu have been building software and data management systems to make sure that we can effectively gather and disseminate our research. Funds from the grant also established a head of research for the OBNS, Old Books New Science Lab itself, Jessica Lockhart, who was to lead our team to work in parallel with the library's team. I sort of disavowed the idea of genius a moment ago, but Dr. Lockhart is as close to a genius as I've met. She is a superb, imaginative lateral researcher. She's particularly genius at finding and bringing together researchers from all around the world who are interested to tell new stories about old books. So let me pause just for a moment on that term, old books. Um, for us, it means handwritten or hand printed rather than um, industrially manufactured books. In modern English, the word book is sometimes used, quite often actually, to mean printed books in codex form. But the word has a much richer history of describing objects that contain texts. Old English bok or book and betch, beach, are probably cognate. And the link between the words suggests an intimate connection between texts and the bark and wood that were used as surfaces for early writing in England. Similar connections are made in other languages that come from the same period of world history. Sanskrit, bajua, uh, masculine means birch tree, and its feminine form means birch bark used for writing. Poti is um, from Sanskrit pustika, book. Um, it's probably related, related to Persian pust, skin or hide. The word book itself, that is, gives us some sense of how books record human interactions with the natural world and each other over time. A book can be made by metal and carbon and gum, pressed onto surfaces by hand or by machines, operated by steam produced by the burning of fossil fuels extracted from the earth. That's how the books you buy at Indigo Books are produced. A book may be made from pulped and strained plant fibers and phytoliths, like these examples um, on the left side of a restored and on the right side of a reproduced ancient papyrus from a fifth century Manichaean manuscript. And this is work done at the Chester Beatty Library. A book may be scraped and rubbed animal skin from sheep and deer or even seals or ostriches sometimes. Books are stuck together, adhered using wheat paste and animal glues. This image shows a, mem a member of our lab, the previously mentioned Dr. Lockhart, head of research, using the electrostatic energy generated by rubbing a PVC conservation eraser to retrieve proteins from adhesives, gluing down the covers 
of a Western European book. Books grow fungi. Um, I like this because one of my hobbies is taking photographs of mushrooms. Here is an example of black mold, not as pretty as a mushroom, growing on a 15th century English manuscript from the Huntingdon Library. Here are some insect legs buried in the gutter of that same manuscript. They are almost certainly those of Cymex lectularius, a bed bug. I am sorry, I should perhaps have offered a trigger warning before putting a picture of a bed bug um, up in front of you. The truth is that the books that you probably love to read, and I assume I have a crowd of readers listening today, if they last, they don't just catch up and carry words. Over time, they also accumulate the feces and carcasses of invertebrates like these that burrow into its pages. Here is a, uh, a, a new slide so that we can avoid thinking about bed bugs for a while. A book can be marked by drops of wax in food scraps, by skin oils, viruses and bacteria from the hands of those who made and read, um, and read books. Books are vibrant. They're not merely receptacles for text or art. They're also archives of materials and lives, past, present and future. I've already indicated that in our lab and in our Silk Roads project, our team aims to pursue neglected truths from history by paying attention to books that disrupt or just don't fit the Gutenberg myth. We also aim at truths neglected because of how we arrange the research that happens within academic disciplines, um, the research on our books, I mean. Books are often, um, not always, but often, the purview of humanist researchers like me whose fields formed in the 19th and early 20th century and tend to be bounded by particular languages or a regionally specific focus, so English literature, um, or sometimes a faith-specific um, po um, focus, so English literature, Jewish studies, Oriental studies, medieval European art history, and so on. The shape of these disciplines is one reason why work on books continues to treat them first as receptacles for written or visual knowledge and art from and about a particular community in a particular moment. And admittedly, that is often the reason that those books were first made, to preserve and share those kinds of records and expressions. But one of the governing assumptions in our lab and also of our Silk Roads project is that handcrafted books are also always witnesses to encounters between craftspeople and the natural environment, or readers in the natural environment, that provided the materials for manufacturing books as well as between different technologies of book production that are not recorded in those books, but were rather passed from one bookmaker to another, localized to, but also shared beyond particular places and times. Understanding the complex layers of knowledge um, within as well as inscribed on books can be vitally enhanced by work from quite different places in the academy, including new technologies and new or newly applied conservation and natural science methods. So for example, a CT, a CT scan of a book using a machine that usually looks for evidence of disorder in the human body, and this is a, um, this is a book uh, going through a CT scanner at sick kids. Um, and it, um, so, so that CT scanner can tell us a lot about the ordered and disordered state of the human body. It can also tell us a lot about the ordered or disordered physical state of a book. Um, and the book that's going through there from, is from Western University Library. It's a choir book. Um, here is uh, um, an example um, of the results that we got from that scan of the book at Sick Kids. A micro CT scanner, and here's a picture of one right here. Um, uh, can tell you even more, breaking the book into thousands of, of slices at the scale of the micron, revealing the grain of the wood, the weave of the threads that hold it together, the metal and the inks that copy its texts. Here, um, there, in, in this example, they're so much denser than the carbon substrate that those inks make a delicate mesh of, let of letters that separate from the rest of the book in imaging. This is fun and informative work. CT is particularly useful for seeing parts of books like sewing or lacing structures or adhesives or bits of reused manuscripts inside the boards that are obscured from the human eye. It has allowed scholars to read the lost texts of unopenable, burned or disintegrating or rotted books, including Herculaneum papyri and Dead Sea Scrolls. The archaeologist and computer scientist Brent Seals and his team have used CT to unroll the text within this object, the carbonized En Gedi scroll, for example. 
But for us, there's something more to this. Methods that focus attention on the material composition and the engineering and re the engineering and re-engineering of books offer, we believe, important new ways of encountering the knowledge about the world that is contained within a book. Methods um, like these are not unencumbered by biases. This kind of work brings lots of biases with it. But they are differently encumbered from the way that humanistic research is, is shaped by biases. When humanist methods meet scientific ones around a book, the result is therefore quite different conversations about them, conversations that can connect objects across space and time in new ways, at the level of structural fractures, for example, or surface chemistry, or microbiome, even as they also provide rich new historical information about a specific object. So let me just give a couple of examples from work that we do in the lab and in the Silk Road project. This is a Birchbark manuscript, copied in Sharada script from an archaeological site in Pakistan. It was rescued in 2020, um, during the pandemic in fact, um, from antiquity hunters by an archaeologist's forum led by Muzaffar Ahmed, who contacted our collaborator Jason Nealis at Wilfrid Laurier University for support. Dr. Ahmad and his colleagues have determined that most of the other manuscripts found at the site, and there were apparently many, have already been sold on the illegal antiquities market and taken out of Pakistan. This is a birch bark manuscript from northwest India or perhaps Pakistan, and again in Sharada script, that was recently discovered in a family attic in Vermont and donated to Williams College, Chapin Library in Massachusetts. Working with Anne Peel at Williams, Mary French and Bex Caswell Olson of the Northeast Document Conservation Centre and Harvard University Libraries, um, we have succeeded in carbon dating the manuscript to the 16th or early 17th century and in building a 3D data model of its very fragile form using micro CT as the first step in what Williams plans as a multi-year investigation and conservation project and here they are starting to conserve the book. Over the next few years, we hope to work with collaborators at each of these locations, in the US, in Canada, in Pakistan, with collaborators like Dr. Ahmad and others at Lahore University for Management Sciences and the Islamabad Cultural Institute in Pakistan, in order to develop the use of micro CT and other methods to study extremely fragile books such as these so that they can share their story once again. So, I want to recap at this point. What I've been trying to tell you is that the research I now do still sometimes touches English copies of Chaucer or books printed by Caxton. I haven't forgot them. But my scope is much wider, and it is not really my scope anymore. I work with others here in Toronto, all over the world, on new collaborative scientific and humanist pr approaches to books of all kinds from all around the globe. This map shows the location of the books that we've been studying in the Silk Road Project, the areas of the world they came from, the people we collaborate with, and it is truly global. So we could have just described the project um, uh, as a network for global book history, and we did consider that. Um, that's what it is. There are several hundred people involved in it now in one way or another. But for the early phase of our work, we deliberately chose a more, what we thought was evocative title. We chose to conjure the famous Silk Road that connected China and East Asia to the Mediterranean Sea and the European continent beyond it from before the beginning of the first millennium, right through the modern period. We chose Silk Road precisely because it captures something powerfully pre-imagined for non-experts, which actually included us. I am an expert, as you've just heard on Western European books, not on Eurasian ones. For me, and we hope for others that we wanted to work with and also communicate with, Silk Roads was a kind of hook something folks had already heard of, conjuring images of caravans of camels bearing gorgeous go goods across deserts and mountains from China to the Mediterranean for thousands of years, at least since uh, 200 before the Common Era. This is the sort of image it conjures, um, and I got this image by Googling Silk Road and pressing image, so this is what Google thinks the Silk Roads are. But we were also conscious as we chose it that Silk Road is a freighted term. It was coined in 1877 by the German geographer Ferdinand von Richthofen. Um, here's a picture of him. Uh, von Richthofen's expeditions to China, his reports and atlases, his particular preoccupation with China's economic resources and commodities, coal and silk, were examples and also tools of a 19th century German expansionism. 
Here's one of von Richthofen's maps. He imagined that he was charting territory that might one day be used for a great railway connecting Asia to, West, to a West Europe led by Germany. Now, as you can see, I took this image from an article by Tamara Chin called The Invention of the Silk Road, and I just want to acknowledge our indebtedness to Professor Chin's thinking, um, including her work on the redeployment of the Silk Road imaginary by the Chinese government to describe their 2013 One Belt, One Road, or Belt and Road initiative, a pattern of deliberate investment by, so -called, by a so-called rising China in countries along the same corridor for economic development that was mapped by von Richthofen. On the one hand, in our project, we seek to depart from these highly political uses of the term Silk Road. The savvy spellers among you will have noticed that we add a scholarly S to our historical Silk Roads. Um, we did that as a way to elaborate different and older stories than Ron Richthofen's or um, that in China right now. The S in Silk Roads is there to recall not one road, but many, shifting over the centuries, including the many sea routes linking the Pacific and Indian Oceans, the Persian Gulf, and the Mediterranean Sea. Our use of the term Silk Roads is meant to capture not just the imagination, but the idea that any old book, as a carrier of knowledge about, as well as a representative product of, networks of exchange, um, that, have always, um, that have always linked people across national boundaries, languages, and faith traditions. Whether those links have worked for good, as they sometimes had, have, or for ill, as they sometimes have. On the other hand, um, thinking of them working for ill sometimes, the fraught political context that produced and popularized the term Silk Road are inescapably a part of what the term is. And in our work, we do mean to be conscious of the belligerent, extractive, and sometimes even genocidal ethno-nationalism and colonialism that inhere in that term Silk Road. They also in here, I have suggested, in the Gutenberg myth, perhaps the most familiar way we've got of thinking about books history here in the West. And colonialism must be one of the historical forces we try to understand when we work on the old books, Western or non-Western, that have ended up far from where they were made in repositories such as the Fisher Library. To that end, um, I want to get to the third um, and final part of my paper, I'm um, going actually talk about some more books from the Fisher Library. Um, so this section is books from the Silk Roads in the Fisher Library. I've already confessed that the re research I'm presenting today is not mine, or not mine alone. I have a further confession. I'm also touting some of our project's wares today. Many of the books I'm about to discuss are currently on display at the Aga Khan Museum here in Toronto. And it's in that context that our team has been working on them. We've been doing so in collaboration with the Fisher, especially curator, Dr. Tim Perry, and with experts from Western University, the Royal Ontario Museum, and the Aga Khan. So if you like the look of the books I show in slides today, I encourage you to get to the exhibit before February 2022 and see them in person. The exhibit is called Hidden Stories, Books Along the Silk Roads, and it displays several dozen books in book-adjacent textiles, implements, and art, all of it from local um, GTHA repositories, chosen, researched, assembled, and finally displayed during this terrible pandemic, when our museums, galleries, and libraries have been unable to build special exhibits from objects borrowed from abroad. So many people contributed to this process, all of us linked almost entirely by computer screens. Each of the objects we selected has a story to tell, anchored by a wall map, that you can see um, that you can see here, um, which gives an overview of ancient land and sea routes of travel and exchange in Eurasia. And I now am going to show you. This is, in fact, the slide I meant to show you a minute ago, which is all the different people um, who worked on this exhibit from all around the world. Um, and then um, this is my next slide, which is a close-up of that map. We show in the exhibit a wide range of book formats, not just the codex from locations across Asia, Europe, and Africa, um, but also scrolls and poetry books, like the one shown here um, on the right from Myanmar, where black text is painted onto gold leaf covered wood. Some of the manuscripts in the exhibit are tiny, meant to be worn as amulets. Others are large, like the massive Antiphona, you saw it go through a CT scanner earlier, a music book loaned for the exhibit by Western University Library. It requires four people to hold it, it's so heavy and it would have enabled a group of performers to sing in harmony. 
QR codes in the ex exhibition bring selected objects to other senses for the visitor. Um, the one for this antiphona allows you to listen to the music on the page. The very last item in the exhibit is this, a textile bound paper and paperboard Sharada script Bhagavad Gita manuscript from Kashmir. And it's one of the books from the Fisher. And we ended with it because it was the first book pointed out to us by Dr. Perry as likely of interest to the book and the Silk Roads project. It actually prompted our idea for the whole exhibit. The only thing known about it um, in the Fisher catalog was the information of a pasted note on the cover in a 19th century English hand. Bhagwat Gita of 600 years old with pictures. The manuscript hadn't yet come to the attention of Sanskrit scholars and South Asianists here at the University of Toronto. In the meantime, our project team had no, um, I'm actually gonna jump to this picture of it, had no training um, in South Asian languages or in fact bookmaking. And yet, the first time we examined the manuscript, we were struck by its pentagonal flap binding and the fact that being attached to the right board, it was the reverse of a more familiar design for ex Islamic style flap bindings because you read the scripts in different directions. That was a starting point. So was the beautiful fabric, which seems to have been the original covering for the boards, which are made of pasteboard. Dr. Lockhart, again, wanted to know whether this fabric extended around the entirety of the structure, even the flap, um, and it's not possible to see because it's covered in a protective layer now. So we pursued our research on two fronts. Uh, Dr. Lockhart took photographs, um, including microscopic ones, um, of all the pages in the manuscript. And we reached out to Luther Obrock, Assistant Professor in South Asian Religions at uni the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Um, Professor Obrock immediately identified the script as Sharada, indicating that the book was likely made in Kashmir. With further work, he was able to identify the contents of the manuscript, not just the holy Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, but a range of devotional texts de uh, devoted to both Vishnu and Shiva, and a poem in honor of the river that runs through Kashmir. The artwork and style of the book identify it as being from the Mughal period. We think from the 17th century, though possibly a little later. Dr. Lockhart noted of the art artwork that Arjuna, the human prince, whose ethical dilemma in conversation with his guide, Lord Krishna, forms the story of the Bhagavad Gita, is represented in Mughal dress. Even, perhaps, um, dressed with a passing resemblance to that worn by Dara Shiko, the oldest son of the Mughal emperor, Shah Jahan, in the mid-17th century. Um, and, and this son sponsored the translation of many Hindu works into Persian during his lifetime. Meanwhile, our lab team was working with engineers from Giovanni Griselli's geomechanics group here at the University of Toronto. With them, we conducted a micro CT scan of the book. Um, here is a cradle for the book, uh, which was made by our colleague Alice Sharp, a member of the lab. Here is the book being scanned. If I wait for long enough, you'll see it moving. Here are the images of the book as they started to emerge from the CT. Our analysis of the volumetric data produced by this process revealed that there were indeed layers of fabric underneath what we could see. And here's one of our key images showing that. A friendly textile expert, Rosemary Krill of the Victoria Al and Albert Museum, used uh, um, the photographs that we'd taken of this fabric to identify it as Indian mushroom fabric, likely from Gujarat. Up at the Aga Khan, there's a whole section of the exhibit devoted to our CT imaging of this and other books and what we've learned from this new approach combined with more traditional ones. And then there are other books at the exhibit, um, other books from the Fisher Library. Two come from regions to the east of Kashmir, connected to it over many, regions connected to Kashmir over many millennia by the movement of people, goods, ideas, and faith. One is um, Fisher Tibetan Manuscript 6, it was copied in the 20th century. Here is um, its lush script up close. Um, this, this image shows just how much of the Fisher Library it takes to unroll this enormous book. Everything that we know about this book comes from another collaborator in our lab, Thinley Gyatso, a Toronto PhD working on Tibetan literatures. He identified the text as one of Rose Skrun, or corpse stories, popular Tibetan folk tales. In the story in this scroll, a prince is assigned the task of catching a corpse from a cemetery in the mountains. The corpse possesses the power to speak, 
but the prince is told not to say a word to it. The prince catches the corpse, but on their journey together, the corpse tells the story of a girl who exchanges pleasure for pain. Fascinated, the prince speaks, and the corpse, freed by his utterance, runs away. Corpse stories like these were written first in Sanskrit, probably in the third century. They were translated into Tibetan, um, and they are still among the most popular secular literatures in Tibet, where they continue even now to be transcribed into handwritten manuscripts like this one, and also read, memorized, and transmitted orally. Another central Asian book displayed in our exhibit and research for our project comes from Nepal, Fisher Manuscript M15. It was copied in about 1780 in the Common Era. It is a copy of the Tantra of the Five Protectoresses, a collection of many magical spells and mantras which would help practitioners treat maladies, prevent disasters, and grant well-being. The text is used even today um, in present-day Nepal on occasions when the goddesses are needed during festivals and other special days. And mantra collections from texts like these are also copied onto physical objects, cloth that can then be tied to the wrist or a twist of paper that can be worn in an amulet. Moving west from Nepal and Kashmir along the Silk Roads, we come to Friedberg um, Manuscript 5021, a Mishnah Torah, authored by the famous 12th century Sephardic philosopher, astronomer, and physician Maimonides, copied into this book by a scribe in Yemen in 1498, the same decade that the Constantinople Arba Turim was printed. Let me just pause to offer some warm thanks here to um, another Fisher curator, Nadav Sharon, for his help as we learned about some of the Fisher's precious collection of Judaica. The Mishnah Torah was a central text for the ancient Jewish community in Yemen. Maimonides had advocated on their behalf during a phase of intense Muslim persecution in Yemen in late 1160 and the early 1170s. Um, so they particularly valued this text. This copy was likely made in the old city of Sana, um, a major hub for pre-modern commerce and cultural interaction, situated at, at the crossroads of the Silk Roads between the Indian Ocean, the Gulf of Aden, and the Red Sea. This Mishnah Torah was written on Islamic style burnished paper, the craft of one faith community giving a sheen and a better surface for writing to the leaves of a book for another faith community. From Yemen, it was a short trip across the Red Sea or the Gulf to Ethiopia. Our exhibit, like the Fisher itself, has a rich collection of Ethiopian manuscripts and book crafts. We work on these with Ayub Darillo, curator of Ethiopian manuscripts at the British Library and a key collaborator for our Silk Roads project. This is Fisher Manuscript 03004, A Life of Jesus Christ. A vivid textile, um, Central Asian in style, but European in manufacture, forms the cover of this manuscript. Um, it has a bookmark and a carrying strap as part of the cover. During Lent, a manuscript like this, a private devotional text, would be worn on the body inside another cover, an animal skin case, which will be kept closed when not in use and hung on the wall. And this is meant to symbolically invoke the womb of Jesus' mother, Mary. Uh, another very recent, I'm told, Fisher acquisition is this 20th century carved and painted wooden book stand um, with two large paintings on the inner surface, the crucifixion at left and Jesus accompanied by Mary and Joseph at right. It, um, it was designed um, to, to, to echo the famous monumental metalwork stands used for communal reading in the churches of the holy city of Lalabella in northern Ethiopia. It can fold up, but here it is open um, so that it can hold a, a holy Ge'ez text. Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library Manuscript 5330, meantime, is an 18th century Ethiopian Quran that was produced in Harar, the capital of a vibrant Islamic emirate that coexisted with the Christian and Jewish communities of Ethiopia. The manuscript's Italian paper, which has a three moons watermark, is evidence of the important commercial and cultural ties um, that linked the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean and the central role of the Horn of Africa in trade and exchange. This three, three, mark, three moon watermark paper came from Italy. Many Christian um, and Islamic traditions traveled to Ethiopia from the north, from Coptic communities and Islamic dynasties of Egypt. Um, this, Freiburg MS 9001, 
a fragment of the Mishnah or oral Torah, is Egyptian from the Cairo Geniza, the famed storeroom discovered in the attic of a Cairo synagogue containing 400,000 fragments of Jewish texts and Fatimid administrative documents dating from the 9th to the 19th centuries of the Common Era. In the Jewish tradition, sacred texts in Hebrew cannot be discarded, so the Geniza held, the, held um, objects like these until they could be properly buried in a Jewish cemetery. In this case, the documents were forgotten, and the resulting treasury of manuscripts, um, which had circulated across the Mediterranean and as far away as South Asia, attest to centuries of close interactions among Jews, Muslims, and Christians in North Africa. The Fisher's Geniza leaves, including this one, date from the 11th century. Another Fisher manuscript, Arabic manuscript 87, a 15th century common era Egyptian copy of um, Hanafi's choice book of fatwas, was an important textbook for teaching Hanafi law in Egypt. It is heavily annotated, um, as you can see, and you can see that even more in this image, um, with what are probably the notes of a faqih, an Islamic jurist who used the book as a teaching tool. Um, here, I must thank uh, a colleague in the Department of Near Middle Eastern Stud Civilizations at Toronto, Professor Jeannie Miller, and also Sarah Amory, a brilliant PhD student in our lab, who also did the bulk of the research on my last Fisher example, a Greek hymnal, Fisher Manuscript uh, 1281. This book is from the early 17th century, and it brings my talk and myself back to that great port and crossroads Constantinople, with its burnished um, paper and leather covers tooled with an almond-shaped stamp. This Christian manuscript shows strong influence of Islamic cra craft practices. Um, that's because the city of Constantinople continued to be an important center for Christian manuscript production after the Ottomans con conquered the region, just as it was a place where the Jewish community printed text. Um, Greek Orthodox Christian manuscripts, Jewish books, and Ottoman Islamic texts were produced side by side in the city. It is from books like these that we can build a global history of the book. This history doesn't proceed from one invention or one material advance to the next, from Roman writing to German printing to Silicon Valley platformization. Instead, it takes wandering and intersecting paths, and as it does, it adds adds newly to our understanding of how human beings keep, carry, share, and pass down the knowledge, the art, and the craft that matters most to them. I started my talk today by trying to give credit where I felt it was due, by thinking of the generosity of a donor, Professor Pathy, and also what it means to me to live and work on indigenous people's traditional lands beside the Missinihi, the Trusting Creek. The University of Toronto's motto is, sorry, the University of Toronto Mississauga's motto um, is tantem nobis creditum. Um, so much has been entrusted to us. We carry that sense of trust in our work on the Silk Roads Project and in and, and the Old Books New Science Lab. We are students and stewards of the knowledge contained by old books. We've inherited these from those who came before. We meant to share them and what we learn from them with those who come after. We are not experts in many of them. We have to rely on those more experts than we, scholars, curators, conservators, from universities, galleries, libraries, and museums around the world. We have to rely on, we owe it to share our work with, the members of local and diasporic communities to whom these objects are tied, by location, by histories, by language, by faith traditions. This global pandemic, which I sincerely hope we're coming towards the end of, has served as such a stark reminder, we have to trust one another because we are all profoundly connected. No matter how far apart we may seem, whether the distance is measured in Zoom screens or closed international borders. That lesson carries to our work in the Old Books New Science Lab too. No single scholar or expert can produce a global history of the book. What we hope is that a global network built on trust can. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alex. So I'll ask Alex to join us. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I have a I have a question for you. How did that class at Oxford go? Oh, um, <laughs> it was it was a brilliant class. Uh, it was uh, it was led by um, Catherine Sutherland, who some of you might 
know as an um, extraordinary scholar of Jane Austen. It wasn't her fault that she wasn't obsessed with the Middle Ages like I was. <laughs> she was busy being obsessed with Jane Austen, who's pretty much the only thing as good as the Middle Ages, in my opinion. So, um, so but it was a brilliant class. We learned so much. And what was brilliant about it was that um, Professor Sutherland, she's a she was a provocative teacher, right? She would come in and she would take a position like the printing press invents the invents the modern conception of the modern idea of the author and then just sort of let us go and let us think about that um, and it was also uh, she worked in the tradition of dear well she worked after um, a, a position had previously been held by df mckenzie but in that tradition of that oxford had very much of um, of bringing students in who who have been trained as literary scholars that's how i've been trained in new zealand before i got there um, but that was true of, of my my colleagues um, who've been trained in the states and been trained in uh, in england as undergraduates england uk as undergraduates um, and say, well, yeah, okay, there's literature, but what about books? Um, like, why haven't you thought about books? And, and just, it was a real sort of, wow, kind of a moment that, that really opened up my eyes to, to a whole field of ideas and objects and thought that, that I hadn't been aware was adjacent to the things that I loved, the, the literature that I loved. And yet there it was. And that was it. She was one of the people who hooked me and I'm still here you know, giving talks, uh, giving talks for friends of the Fisher. Thank you. So um, I'm encouraged, or I very much encourage our um, audience to submit their questions um, into the question and answer for Dr. Gillespie. And we actually have our first question, and that is, um, you referred to many manuscripts by their contemporary names based on current ownership, um, i.e. Fisher Manuscript 01281. What steps can be taken to refer to the manuscripts by um, by names which are more respectful of their heritage, um, especially their creation or use by the creating commun community? Um, I saw that question and I thought, I, why haven't I thought about that question before? And to, I'm going to be completely honest, I haven't. And it just shows how our training, the biases that we come into, you know, that we, ca they ca we carry to certain um, fields with us, we can think that, you know, I like to think I've spent decades trying to shake some of these things but I still just just a couple of days ago I'm sorry I suddenly am in the dark because I'm in one of those rooms where the lights go off if you don't move enough and apparently I've been too still so I'm just gonna there we go much better so it's my office at UTM um so um just a couple of days ago we were talking about our um the database of um of books that we've been developing or database not quite the right word but the kind of collection of books we've been developing um, 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 data sets for um, and the software that's being developed by the information technology services team at, Fisher, at, um, at U of T libraries um, and how we were going to label those books and head of research Dr Lockhart again who's sort of haunting this talk said um, what do you want do you want title or do you want shelf mark and I said oh always shelf mark just just say that always shelf mark like that's the way um, that, that I was taught to do it. Like if you're a serious manuscript scholar, you refer to books by shelf mark. It's only, it's only non-serious people who call it a Shakespeare or a, you know, or, well, actually that wouldn't be a manuscript, would it? A Chaucer or, a, or, or the Canterbury Tales, you know, I know to call it Lord Miscellaneous 789. Um, what I really love about your question, and I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to it, but I'm going to have to develop one. Um, we are going to have to develop one, is your point that those are their, their colonial labels or their not necessarily colonial. It depends. It depends on how you think about what is colonial, but they are um, they are not titles that, as you say, necessarily and in fact, they very rarely uh, respect the cre the creators or even the communities that most identify with these objects um, that have um, that have the strongest ties to these objects. And uh, I think probably the solution is to um, one of the solutions. Well, one of the solutions you already hinted at is to ask, right? To actually go back to the um, may, maybe local, so therefore perhaps overseas or diasporic local, as in here in GTHA. Lots of um, we work uh, reasonably closely. I hope in the future even more closely with the Ethiopian community, for example, here in Toronto, um, and uh, uh, and and speak to them. Um, that the answers probably shouldn't come from a, a white lady from New Zealand um, who works at University of Toronto to that question, but um, but that it is our responsibility to ask the question. So I, I thank you for the question. It, it was a transformative one for me when I read it. Thank you. I was going to say, I, I actually have a, a slightly similar question, and that is um, on the other end, it's sort of being the institution that holds these materials. We are very careful about the provenance because quite often 
it's the possibility where these materials may have been stolen or improperly taken out of the country and then put on put on the market. Um, have you or your team had any discussions, for example, about provenance or problematic yep. provenance of the materials as well? Yep, that's a pretty standard conversation that we have as our conversations about even where there is a um, even where there is a clear sort of history of how the book has moved and you can't point to any particular illegality, you can nonetheless point to perhaps a, again that those histories of extraction of, I mean, there's a there's a book in Auckland Public Library, I'm sorry to not talk about the Fisher, but Auckland Public Library in New Zealand, which, um, which is a, a Greek um, it's not a hymnal, it's a Greek lectionary that, um, that the um, Quaritch sold to Sir Governor George Grey in the 1860s, telling him that it had been obtained from the monasteries in, um, in Mount Athos, one of the monasteries in Mount Athos. And um, it is actually possible that uh, that might just be a story Quaritch was telling, the bookseller was telling, but it's possible that that was the case. And if it was, it, it fall, it's in line with stories that a couple of sort of uh, British traveler adventurers of the period told about going to those monasteries which were strapped for cash which were you know they, they were um they were struggling and saying you know hi you could give me a you could just give me one of those books um and um and they they really the these um these these travelers tell these stories about and then you know one of them offered me one book but i took two instead and so on so so sometimes the stories are um, actually tell us that even if a book was not obtained illegally or uh, was not looted, stolen, sold illegally, I mean, even the provenance is, is, um, is not like that. Um, there are still um, there are still ways in which the acquisition was problematic. And, um, and we have to think about what to do about that. I mean, this is not a conversation just for the Fisher. It's a conversation for, you know, uh, repositories in the Western world right now, you know, right across, um, you know, right across the world. Um, how do we, um, what do we do about these, um, these objects and the stories about how they ended up here and how can we be respectful um, of, um, of their complex histories? And I don't, I don't have simple solutions except to give the same answer that I gave to the last questioner, which is ask the communities that either made, made them or who have the strongest um, ties and connections, who have language ties, who have faith ties, who have geographical ties and so on, ask like, one question is to ask and see what see what see what comes of that. A lot of knowledge sharing will come of that, and that would be a very good place to start. Thank you. So we do have a, another question, and it says um, it asks the person asks in Ethiopian manuscript were there many comments written into the margins done by anyone who read the book. So a couple of answers there. One is that um, I suspect that in my rapid world tour from like uh, Nepal all the way to Constantinople very quickly, um, I, um, I was not sufficiently clear that at one point I'd moved from Ethiopia to Egypt. And I suspect the book you're talking about is actually one of the Egyptian ones, which is the legal text from the 15th century, which is absolutely covered in annotations. In that case, I fear that Jeannie Miller, my, my amazing colleague in the Middle Eastern, is here and and she can correct me if I'm wrong if she is um, but in that case I understand that the notes are very much by readers users students teachers this book is being I mean it's got bits pasted on it and that have come out and they've stuck it back in and notes written in all different directions and so on. this is a real working text um, and so the answer there is yes in the case of the Ethiopian um, manuscripts that I showed, they are holy books in, in, uh, in many instances. They're scripture, um, they're liturgical manuscripts and so on. And they tend not to have notes written in them. They do, however, have other kinds of marks. They have bookmarks marking particular readings. They have, um, they have score marks to indicate you know, a, a, a passage of interest or a passage of concern and so on. Um, that isn't true of all Ethiopian books, but, um, but, uh, but often these books which you know are from monasteries from churches and so on have been have been kept in that way for you know because the idea is you're going to keep them for a thousand years and they will keep serving as holy scripture for you for that long so so not necessarily that you keep them pristine um but that that is their purpose rather than as for example a teaching text um so that would be my broad answer there um so we have another question and that is um what responsibility do we have to respect religious rules about the use or display of a book? Um, for example, if its original use was initially limited to certain people, um, should we um, or libraries make these uh, um, items um, available 
um, more broadly than what their original purpose or use was? Um, are there rules for scholars? Um, so many interesting questions <laughs> coming up here, all the ethical questions, right? And what's interesting to me about them is that, again, these are questions being asked not only of books, but other kinds of um, cultural heritage objects at the moment. And they're being asked in new kinds of ways and that is exactly as it should be. I have a student um, who, uh, um, Ashley Morford, who I doubt is here because she works on modern, like contemporary, present day Philippine, Philippine X and, um, and indigenous literatures, which was my PhD student for complicated reasons to do with the digital humanities project uh, work that she was doing. Um, and she kind of blew my mind one day when, um, when I said to her, I think you need to work more closely on this text that you're talking about. Like, why, why are you not, why are you skimming over the surface? And she said, well, the text hasn't given me consent to work on it, has it? And I'm like, and she's like, and has the author given me, like, what about, who is this book for? Is it for me? Is it for me to read it like that? And so she just, she had a whole set of, um, well, she was developing frameworks of thought about these objects that were so different from mine, like, that, you know, that are, again, it's all these questions, right, throw me up against my own assumptions. Again, my answer to the question, you know, should you display a book if it is, um, if it was in its moment of production, um, specifically for a particular small community not intended for display, you know, and so on and so forth, so forth is, I'm definitely not the person to answer that question, but um, the faith community, the communities that still exist, the people who um, whose, whose heritage this is, if we understand those kinds of patterns of possession and belonging or of connection and reciprocity, um, they, that, that's where that decision making has to happen. But that's a huge job, um, and and which is not to say it shouldn't be undertaken. But the, the, this is about, I feel like we're, li we're living in a moment around cultural heritage objects where we are beginning to map out what this is going to look like over the next century. Like this is gonna be a lot of work of undoing one extractive model of, hey, I, I, here's a great book that I got from someone who was too poor to say no to the money I offered them. Let's put it on display at our in our repository to how can we collaborate with, um, with communities um, in our own locations and, 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 in, and connected to the object in its original location to find new and differently respectful, more respectful ways of connecting to objects. I will note that um, one of the things that my lab works on is birch bark um, technologies from, uh, from the Great Lakes region, Eastern Woodlands um, in North America, but also Novgorod in Russia, Scandinavia um, and um, Tibet. Kashmir and so on. And Birchbuck is used as a substrate for writing across all those very, very different communities at different moments in history. Um, and there are many sacred scrolls of indigenous people in the Great Lakes region um, that, are, that are truly not meant to be consulted by people like me or um, by anyone who's not a member of, um, of a particular community and in a um, in particular religions. And, and in that case, we don't. We don't, like the refusal is an extremely important component of, of this kind of research. And for me, it's new. Like I, I never worried about whether Chaucer or Caxton was really, really dislike what I was doing in part because I was pretty sure they wouldn't given the, the philosophical, I, you know, I just didn't think about it because the philosophical cultural traditions they belonged to. Um, that idea of refusal of saying, no, we don't want to be studied. We don't want our, our cultural heritage to be studied and so on, um, that, that is, that is another part of this of this new journey that I think that um, folks have to go on. Um, and the best way we can do it, I, I said it in my last se sentence of the paper, right? Um, we have to build trust. It has to begin there. And we have to recognize that there isn't trust when we start because so much of this story has been about ex extract extraction, colonialism, and violence done to other people's histories. So how do we begin to build trust? What what does that look like? And I'm I'm just asking questions back of this crowd I'm sorry I'm not providing very many answers but that's they're the questions I want to come up like that feels like what matters about this work some of what matters about this work well they're complex and they're not easily resolvable no I mean sometimes you'll have folks say yeah they are pretty easily resolvable actually give the object back um, and that actually sometimes is absolutely the right answer um, but sometimes they're not because what 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 of for example should we give back um, this is a um, you know rhetorical question the Huntington Library, I did a lot of my work on, on Chaucer and Caxton at the Huntington Library. Should that material go back to England, right? So there's a, there's a question there. And if the answer is no, because 
um, the United States of America was founded on, you know, partly on, on travelers from that very place, um, it, you know, part, very much partly, then there's a similar kind of a story um, emerge around um, the, you know, a, a repository like the Fisher, which not only is not only here to serve Anglo Canadians or French Canadians or whatever, it's also here to serve the extraordinary array of diverse diasporic communities that is global Toronto in the 21st century. And, um, and you know, that includes a vibrant Ethiopian community, amazing Egyptian community and so on. And so uh, d might these objects belong here and some, some of them, not all of them, some of them belong here because of their connections to those communities um, or is there work that can be done there? Um, and certainly is it a way that the, the riches and resources of an institution like the University of Toronto can be better shared um, uh, because of the, those potential connections. So that's a, and I say better in the sense that there's no doubt this institution spent a lot of years of its existence um, sharing mostly with you know British and Br British really colonizers like that. That was its um, that that's its her that's its heritage. Um, not not even French ones. Um, so I don't know. I feel like I'm in terrible political territory right now and. Um, possibly, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I want to point out I am Canadian, but I'm not very Canadian. <laughs> so I shouldn't talk about the French and the British. Um, uh, so in the we're going to talk about something completely different then. Yeah, let's and go to something else. Someone got a question about binding. <laughs> um, I'm actually curious about your team. So I'm just so amazed that, that humanists, um, people with your expertise are so engaged on this, in the scientific mm -hmm. side of things, mm -hmm. with scanning books and I was just wondering, um, what what is is your team primarily people who are experts in book history? Do you do you have curators on your teams? Do you have, do you have um, well, you have computer scientists on your team? Um, so the answer is sort of yes to everything, but also kind of no as well. So. Um, I'd start by saying I should distinguish between the immediate team, so students I, whose PhDs I supervise or other research I supervise, um, and employees of the project who I supervise. Um, I supervise or, or Suzanne Akbari does or Sean Meikle does and so on, and that's an important distinction too. They're not, they're not exactly part of the lab, but they are so close to it that they, they feel like a part of it. I hope that's okay for me to say to them. I think Sean's probably here. Um, and um, so there, there's sort of an immediate team. In that immediate team, I'd say most people have come in the same way I came in through the study of medieval English literatures, not necessarily just English ones, some in you know, Latin and, um, and French traditions of, and other um, you know, Welsh and, um, and Irish and so on, and Scots traditions of the, of the British Isles. They've come in through the study of those literatures and they've ended up over, over, where, over where I am as well, in part because they've taken a class with me or they develop their own interests that then intersect with some of mine. Um, what, uh, like me, um, you know, some, some stay, some in that community stay very focused on, on um, their interest in literature or in history or in theology or whatever it is that has attracted their interest. Others um, get the, catch the bug as it were, which is no pun intended, are like, wow, like, you know, and then sometimes stories emerge like, oh yeah, I actually did half a biology degree or I, I started in computer science and then I switched over. And I always feel like that, like I had to make, or I decided to make a choice in my first year of university to leave behind biology, which was my other great interest. Um, hence the interest in mushrooms and so on, and to go, you know, all arts and humanities, and um, and, and we are we're direct we're directed to do that. And I do think, as I say, that disciplinarity matters; that it forms particular kinds of knowledge that are very valuable to us. I'm pleased that the vaccine developers right now work on vaccines and not like vaccines and poems. Like, I, disciplinarity and expertise are really important. But um, but that curiosity that that having established your expertise. You try to find ways to open yourself up to other kinds of knowledge that might help transform your thinking um, is something that I really value. And that's where I said, you know, there are, there are other answers. You know, I mentioned Sean's team, Suzanne's team. But I, at one point during the talk, as I was listening to it, I talk about um, something we did. And I realized we didn't do that. That was um, Felice. Um, uh, Felice uh, Philip up at the Aga Khan Museum, and I've just collected her up in my we. Uh, she's one of the curators of, of, of um, Islamic um, art up at the Aga Khan, and um, she 
and I clicked her up in my Wii because we have so many people who we work with internationally who, when we're trying to answer a question, they become part of the project. And we do acknowledge, like we do acknowledge that as we publish and so on. But, but there, um, and, and those people do include engineers, scientists, you know, all sorts of people. The fun, one of the fun parts of, of the work we do is trying to find, trying to get far enough into someone else's discipline that you can have a conversation with them without tripping well, over your own ignorance. Um, and it works both ways. The engineers have to learn stuff about history and poetry. It's good for them. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you though, um, sometimes is there a language issue? Are things, are things ever lost yes. in translation? And, I'm, and, and there's always a risk in this kind of radically interdisciplinary work that because you can't find a common, because you, you're deeply expert in your own area and they're deeply expert in theirs, the only point at which the conversation can happen is, a, is, a, is not deep, right? It's at a shallower level and you end up doing superficial work. That, that is a risk. Um, and we think about that risk um, that, you know, how, how do you, and I think the solution is, in, in respecting expertise, right, and respecting that deep knowledge, that the knowledge that is that goes down a long way, while understanding that there is also important kinds of knowledge that do occur as different bodies of information are networked, are put together, like that. That has its that has a it, it does different kinds of things, if that makes sense. And when you tell a story, like the one I was telling, um, you know, about these books on the Silk Roads, I mean the the these were tiny snippets at the very surface of very complex histories and yet it's still important I think to sometimes to be telling to be telling those stories at other times you want to ask Jeannie Miller a bit more about the annotations on that manuscript um, because she's the expert. Um, so speaking of um, the Aga Khan Museum I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the exhibition. Enormously fun to produce. I mostly just watched as I <laughs> spent my first year in my new role as vice president and principal at, at UTM um, as our as the labs team, as uh, Susan Akbari and Felice Philip um, and, uh, and those working for them set about bringing together objects when we couldn't even go and look at them because we were that deep in lockdown um, and where other exhibits had, had had to be cancelled um, at these repositories because or at these um, at these galleries and museums because of the pandemic and so on and sort of it, the thing we were trying to do or, or they were trying to do and I was cheering on from the sidelines as I I don't know worked on getting vaccinations into into folks here in this community um the um the the thing we were trying to do is say how can we tell the story about the Silk Roads here here in Toronto which which harkens back to some of what I was saying about on the one hand you can say and I think that if if a community says if a community and obviously says that object is ours and it should never have left, that that is that has to be listened to and responded to. But um, but it is also the case that the Silk Road story is a story of Toronto. It is a story of the people who have immigrated here. It is a story of their interests and concerns of of their own heritage, of the heritage of their neighbours, um, and so on. And that was a great that we believed. But to discover that through um, through these collections, the Wom, um, Fisher, and um, and Aga Khan, in some cases to discover it because yeah, some of these objects have been appropriated by colonizers and ended up somewhere. In other cases, because they've been brought by some someone from Iran or China who now lives in who now lives in Toronto, and so this these complex stories, um, it, it was it was. It was amazing. It made me, not for the first time, just feel very, very privileged to live here um, in, in this part of the world, this fascinating part of the world. Yeah. Don't know we always think of Toronto as a fascinating part of the world. We think of like the Silk Roads, right, with the camels and so on. And yet that that is here too. That story is part of a part of this place as well. well. I think we were, we at the Fisher were delighted to be part of the exhibition. And um, it was actually really, I'm, I'm so glad you highlighted the Ethiopic book stand because it literally only arrived in Canada, I think just the end of September, early October. Mm. So it arrived in the Fisher and was sent right over to the Aga Khan. I find that I should pause actually. I mean, there's so many, I've, I've been trying to thank as many people as possible, but every couple of, of sentences, I think, oh, I should thank that person as well. I should thank um, the folks at the Fisher, at the ROM, at Western University Library, at the Aga Khan, 
who just, um, you know, we, we went to Rom and Fisher and said, we would really like these books. They would tell our story perfectly. And then, you know, there was this extraordinary work that went on where folks were like, well, no, you can't have that because we can't get that bound because, or framed because we're in lockdown. So that isn't going to work. But, but instead of saying that isn't going to work, that's the end of it. We, these extraordinary collaborations sprung up with curators and librarians um, to say, what about this object? Is it, or if that's what you're interested in, what about this? I mean, curators, I, I listed them as, as some of our, and librarians are some of our most important uh, collaborators, in part because their knowledge of collections and their ability to hear an idea that you've got and say, I've got the book for you is unparalleled and, um, and it was so, so powerfully shown. There was also such a lot of generosity and hard work that went on and you know, none of us were, it wasn't on any of our schedule to do this. You know, it was a kind of response to COVID-19 as something else we could do. So thank you to the Fisher and the ROM, if anybody is here and the Ivy Cup and Western University Library. Thank you for your incredible generosity. So um, I don't think we have any more questions, Alex. Um, thank you so much for your time. It was a huge a pleasure. Um, love talking about this stuff. Um, it's always a pleasure to be at the Fisher and, and it's such a thrill to, um, to have this chance to, to talk about some of these books that I, that I care about so much. I'm really delighted that you were able to take time out of your incredibly, incredibly busy schedule to join us this evening. So, so thank you. And, and thank you for making all of these materials more discoverable. Um, and I very much encourage everyone um, to go to the Aga Khan Museum uh, when they can to actually check out the exhibit. They have until February, the end of February. February, February 2022. We are going to be running a small symposium in February 2022 to close that down. So if you watch out, there might be more webinars and so on if you're really interested. But I would also say, you know, there's something, there is something amazing about seeing these books in the flesh, as it were. And we don't, you know, folks who are not, to, in answer to that earlier question, you know, do scholars get special access? Well, yeah, on some level we do, right? Like, and but this is one of those moments where we say, no, these these are for maybe they're not for everyone. That's a that's a tricky question. But um, but but these these are this knowledge is to be shared, and here is a here is a way of sharing it with those who perhaps are not always able to access it. So I I do I I hope folks will go. It's also stunning. I mean, the Aga Khan is such a beautiful museum anyway, and the work of the design the two designers on the team as well as the curators up there. I mean, I mean, I'm biased, but I'm like, this is the most beautiful exhibit I've ever seen anywhere. And, you know, I, I feel, I feel hype, hype. I think it's, I think I'm just biased. <laughs> but, and I also think that, that those feelings resulted from the fact of being trapped inside our houses, right? For about, and then suddenly getting to go to a museum and there are objects again, there are things and there are people and how, how magical that is. So I hope that folks will take that opportunity. And again, thank you for letting me, to, letting me tout the, tell the exhibit which is also of course a Fisher a Fisher exhibit too so thank you Alex so um we don't have any more questions for you just lots of kud uh, kudos in the chat so, oh. so thank you thank you um, thank you Sean is here so she can uh folks can ask her any questions about any inaccuracies in my presentation at some point <laughs> um so so thank you so much Alex and and thank you so much um Oh, actually, Sean says every person on this project is so deeply grateful for your vision and passion for inquiring capacity to carry people with you. You're opening up our world. Isn't that a really lovely tribute? I've, I'm blushing a little bit. Um, <laughs> I would just say, you know, the um, the moment at which I, uh, I when I came to University of Toronto, I, um, the first thing I discovered was the Fisher Rare Book Library and, and PJ and Laurel and others will remember the, the years in which I haunted the library and it was my home. And a little bit later, about 2012, I met the ITS team and Sean's team. And I was like, oh, I just found my second home at the University of Toronto as the Fisher. And then, then there's these people in the library. So thank you to, thank you to um, U of T libraries. This is kind of sort of mutual admiration society, but I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Thanks. Well, and Sean, Sean's family upstairs on the, um, on the seventh floor is a pretty wonderful team. So. Yeah, they are. We're very, we're very lucky here at U of T and in Robots and UTL and Fisher. We, we, it is. I mean, they say they do say, was it second or third best university um, library in North America? I'm like, oh, come on, best. Like, <laughs> the best. I don't know what this the second or third thing is. We are so lucky. So, 
Well, thanks thank also to everyone who's signing off, I imagine, um, uh, um, for coming. And thanks uh, to those who asked questions for some really thought-provoking, quite, transform quite transformative questions. They were great. And thank you, Alex. And thank you, Dr. Pathy, as well. So we're incredibly grateful and I'm grateful for all of your time. And, and just a quick note, too. Um, Alex was speaking about access. And today, the Fisher, it was the first time in several months that the Fisher has been open to researchers. Um, we're still working on our front door, but we have a temporary door and um, researchers um, can um, start to do research in person at the Fisher by appointment. So um, it was a very exciting day on a lot of Congratulations. levels. That's, uh, it is like, as people start coming back, I, yeah. Who, who knew we would be so grateful for such some simple things as being able to come in person and look at some books. It's, that's no silver linings to this pandemic. I don't like to say that, but we have learned how valuable those opportunities are. Yeah, and how grateful we are for a lot. How grateful, that's right. Um, well, thank you, everybody. Have a lovely evening. Thank you, Goodbye. Alex. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Dr. Pathy, and take care, everybody, until we yes, see thanks. you again. Thanks, Professor Pathy. <laughs> Bye. Bye now.